He's been Speaker of the Georgia House for seven sessions. What does David Ralston have to say about the one that's about to adjourn? Campus carry, MARTA expansion, medical marijuana. The going hasn't always been easy. And then there's the religious liberty battle as well. As Sine Die looms, Speaker Ralston joins us for an appraisal of the 2016 session. Lawmaker starts right now. Good evening and welcome to Lawmakers. I'm Bill Nygut. Can you believe it's already day 39? No doubt legislators still have their work cut out for them this session. They'll continue their efforts until the lieutenant governor and House Speaker David Ralston shouts, "Signy die. Let's start by checking in with Shelby Lynn. She's down at the Capitol with the latest developments under the Gold Dome. Shelby? Hi, Bill. It's been an incredibly busy day here at the Capitol for Georgia lawmakers with dozens of bills on the calendar. 85 in the Senate alone. But even with the full schedule, senators spent most of the morning talking about religious liberty legislation again. Now, I know you're going to talk with House Speaker David Ralston tonight about it, but senators spent most of the morning trying to convince Governor Nathan Deal to ignore outside pressure and sign HB 757 into law. There was a statement made uh, by the Atlanta Falcons, a professional football club, they were in the news 10 days ago for one of their coaches quizzing a player at the NFL Combine about his sexual orientation. But they're giving a lecture to the Georgia General Assembly on tolerance and inclusion. It's time for our governor to step forward and sign the bill that the people of Georgia clearly want. The bill has been vetted thoroughly through both chambers of the General Assembly. Now, I appreciate the fact that our governor has taken a slow and methodical view of the bill before he signs it. But in the end, I'm sure that he'll find that uh, this is the best bill to protect everyone in Georgia. But the Senate passed a number of bills today, including HB 792, which would allow students over 18 to carry tasers for protection on college campuses. HB 741 would limit a police officer's grand jury testimony in cases that involve the use of deadly force. In HB 205, the ignition interlock bill would require these locks on the cars of first-time drunk drivers if they refuse a blood alcohol test when they're stopped. In this accelerated session of the General Assembly, there's a lot of legislation that hasn't passed that's been left on the table. We're taking a look back at some of those bills. Representative Scott Holcomb's Justice for Rape Victims Act, which would have mandated the GBI test all backlogged rape kits in the state, possibly some 1,500 of them, passed the House on a near-unanimous vote. But it's been held up in the Senate Health and Human Services Committee by Chairwoman Renee Unterman, who has said she does not think the bill is necessary. The rape kit bill um, did not get the traction that we had hoped as a woman, um, someone living in Metro Atlanta. Uh, having friends that have been victims of sexual assaults, I mean, certainly I'm tremendously disappointed. There are rape kits sitting on shelves today um, across the state that are not being tested, That which means um, rape victims are not getting justice and their, um, their perpetrators are not being brought to justice. Um, and we can do something about that by simply passing this bill. And unfortunately, it's been held hostage in the Senate for, for no good reason. Representative Stacey Evans calls the session, quote, pretty unproductive, unquote, this year, in the sense that she says many bills that would have helped real Georgians were just left on the table. One bill that would have really done a lot to help our workforce and help our students and families who were looking to move into the middle class was a bill that I proposed, House Bill 22, um, which didn't make it out of the House, and that would have fully funded the HOPE grant to cover the full cost of tuition for students who attend our technical colleges. Waits proposed legislation that would have limited the police from engaging in emergency chases, but that bill didn't get anywhere. That was a resolution, which is an urgent res resolution. It's my understanding that we do not have a constitutional authority to weigh in on those conversations in terms of police jurisdiction. So uh, a resolution would simply urge, it's not a mandate, but it would simply urge uh, law enforcement communities to not give chase in situations that were not felony related. 
Several gambling bills also failed to get the traction needed, although at one point before crossover day, it looked like they were gaining support. Yeah, the casino bills are obviously also a big, um, something that everybody was talking about coming into the session that did, never really made it. There was a, a glimmer of hope that they were going to start moving right there around crossover day, but that didn't happen. I think those are bills that you'll see back next year. Senator Elena Parent says she's hopeful a bill she sponsored dealing with the records of people who have been involuntarily committed will pass the legislature. Right now we have an automatic purge after five years from persons who have been involuntarily committed from the National Federal Instant Background Check Database, which really makes no sense. Um, it's bad from a public policy safety perspective. So the legislation changes that. It eliminates the automatic purge and instead puts into place a procedure whereby someone can apply uh, to back, back to the, the court that involuntarily committed them, which is typically a probate court. Finally tonight, Bill, one thing we know that has to pass this session is the 2017 state budget. We know that lawmakers have been meeting behind closed doors trying to reach a compromise, and when they do, we'll let you know. That's it from the Capitol. Back to you in the studio. Thanks, Shelby. Tonight, I am joined in the studio by our longtime friend and uh, political insider Jim Galloway. As his blog title suggests, he is their political insider. He writes column on Thursdays and Sundays in the Dead Tree edition of the paper, but also blogs in Political Insider every day online. And our special guest, a man who really needs no introduction, he is the Speaker of the Georgia House of Representatives, David Ralston. Thank you both so much for being here, especially you, Speaker Ralston. You uh, are in a very busy time. Uh, the session just one day left. We are taping this show on Monday, but by the time it airs, you will be well into day 39 and uh, on your way to signy die on day 40. So thanks for coming in. Great to be here. Great to be with uh, both you and Jim. So I suppose we have to start mm -hmm. with a question that is of no surprise to you, and that is uh, to ask you if you can help Help us understand where you think we're headed with um, what the governor is going to do with the religious liberty bill. But also, if we can, I'd love to talk to you a little bit about the process that brought us uh, to the bill that now sits on his desk. Fair enough? That's fair. So with that in mind, you started this session with a piece of legislation called the Pastor Protection Act that uh, seemed to be... Uh, innocuous enough to the extent that in a very charged environment, virtually everybody was on board to support it. Um, why did it get complicated? Well, the General Assembly is not just the House of Representatives. Uh, we have another uh, legislative chamber across the hall, and, and certainly uh, we, uh, the House and the Senate, look at issues differently sometimes. Uh, I say that very respectfully. Um, and they had um, concerns about the issues that were different than our concerns. Um, I was very proud of the Pastor Protection Act. Uh, I thought it was a very uh, uh, narrow, narrowly tailored piece of legislation that uh, addressed the concerns of, of many people, uh, including many in my district, uh, who... Uh, who, who wanted to ensure and wanted us to reinforce uh, the protections that uh, the faith community had <clears throat> regarding their own uh, uh, interpretation of the institution of marriage. Uh, I thought that did that. We passed it out of the House unanimously, as I recall. It went over to the Senate. They had a measure that uh, uh, they had embraced uh, the, the the First Amendment Defense Act. Uh, Senator Greg Kirk's bill. Correct. Uh, they uh, elected to put it on uh, our bill and send it back over. Meanwhile, we still had uh, the uh, uh, Religious Freedom Restoration Act, the RIFRA, that was still out there, and there was some interest in, um, in, in moving the discussion forward on that. Um, so, you know, you had these competing viewpoints uh, and um, in, in what I think was a very open and inclusive process. We worked, this issue's been um, uh, part of the uh, discussion around the Capitol now for at least two years. Uh, so when, after the Senate acted, uh, um, my office got involved in trying to, to work with all 
parties that had an interest in this issue uh, to uh, develop a bill that uh, addressed the concerns of those who supported uh, the First Amendment Defense Act and the RIFRA bill, and by the same, at the same time, make sure that we pass something that was non-discriminatory. Well, that's what I was going to ask, and then I want to get <clears> Jim, uh, <throat> Galloway involved here. Do you believe that the bill that now rests on the governor's desk uh, is free from the kind of uh, discrimination, potential for discrimination, that so many of the critics out there are now shouting about, or do they not understand the language of the bill? I think it is free of discrimination. Otherwise, I would not have uh, allowed it to go forward. Uh, I, w w we've come a long way in Georgia, um, and I wanted Georgia to, knowing that there was a, <clears throat> a large number of people around the state that had a strong interest in the uh, uh, First Amendment Defense Act and the RIFRA, uh, but by the same token, I don't think Georgians want to send uh, the wrong message about what kind of state we are, and I wanted us to message that we are a welcoming state. We're a big, growing state, um, and uh, I, I am comfortable uh, that the process was fair, that it was thoughtful, it was measured, um, and I think the product that uh, uh, resulted in the final version of uh, House Bill 757, uh, I think if people will step back, take a deep breath, and read the bill, I think they will agree. But, but Mr. Speaker, you say that you say you don't think 757 discriminates, and yet you also you've also said that it, it it's probably going to be up to courts to determine whether local <clears throat> ordinances protecting LGBT rights in Georgia, the city of Atlanta has Athens and a few other cities, uh, will remain in force. If they don't remain in force, doesn't that constitute discrimination right there? Well, it would be a court determination, Jim, based on the facts of the case that came before the court. Um, you know, we pass bills that are signed into law every session. <clears throat> Those ultimately, many of them get tested in court cases uh, under a specific set of facts that may arise that, you know, I can't sit here or uh, any of us can sit here and predict what they might be uh, today. Uh, but, um, you know, the, the, the local ordinances were a big part of the discussion. Uh, and, and so, the, you know, the, the decision was made that those really need to be determined by the judicial branch rather than by the uh, legislative branch. And that's what we did. And this is why you didn't, I mean, you include protections under state and federal correct. statutes. But mm -hmm. this is why you didn't include local. That's correct. So... Mr. Speaker, let me propose a scenario and, and see if you want to confirm it or not. Um, it appears to observers, to, to people, well, to me, uh, that when you introduced pastor protection, mm -hmm. when, when you decided that was the way to go, that you wanted to be able to offer to your members uh, a bill that would allow them to say, yes, we recognize our constituents uh, in the face of a Supreme Court decision about gay marriage, may have conflicting different values, and we think it's important to pass a measure that expresses to them that we understand their concerns, and we want them to know that we recognize that those traditional values matter. But you did it in such a way that it didn't even raise the specter that there could be uh, discrimination of any kind um, in the language of the bill. Senator Kirk's First Amendment Defense Act seemed to go the opposite direction entirely. It did seem to open the door clearly for discrimination, particularly against gays and lesbians. And it feels as if, in a way, it, they, he complicated for you in the Senate by attaching it to your bill, uh, put you in a, in a somewhat uncomfortable position that you're suddenly having to swallow a measure that wasn't what you really wanted in the first place, but that your members had to go along with for the sake of their constituents. I think, I think it was important that we resolve this debate as best we could this session. Uh, he didn't really complicate our job. Uh, I could have complicated their job even more by taking that, uh, his measure, out of my bill and sending it back to the Senate. Right. Uh, and then all we do is guarantee that this is gonna continue to be a political issue for at least another year or more. Uh, and I think that it was time that we had 
uh, some closure, frankly. Uh, and, and, and yeah, we're in the third session of dealing. We with are, this. Right. right? But but uh, but are we going to get closure? I mean, I mean, over the weekend, as as we've been seeing some of the reaction pass, uh, there was a, a a a a letter put out by Tony Perkins with the Family Research Council, which expressed great disappointment that this bill doesn't cover uh, individual conscientious objectors or individual businesses. It's related to religious affiliated uh, uh, enterprises. Uh, that that kind of telegraphs that this issue is is going to come back again and again and again, does it not? Well, you know, um, <clears throat> as a country lawyer, I've often heard it said that the most fair agreement in a divorce case is one that both parties are unhappy with. Um, and so people, I think, on both sides of this issue, the, the, his letter, I think, is indicative uh, of the fact that uh, people need to read the bill. Uh, if his objective, uh, and I'm not saying this is his goal, but if his objective is to legitimate discrimination, then I'm not having anything to do with that. And, and we, we have studiously tried to avoid doing that. And yet we're having criticism from both sides uh, in, the, in the days after. Um, and then again, that's why I say, I think the best thing people can do is sort of calm down, take a deep breath, read the bill. Uh, and I think they'll see that it is fair and measured and reasonable uh, uh, and, uh, and can bring closure. I, I want to close out <clears throat> because we have a lot more we want to talk about. But one last question, if I may. Um, you do think that if we all take a deep breath and read this bill <clears throat> carefully, it'll become clear that it, it is not what it's, the critics say, an, a, a door opening for a discrimination, an, an open door for discrimination. The problem, of course, is perception matters so much, as you know, Mr. Speaker. And the perception is out there, not just in Georgia, but across the country. There are major news organizations like the New York Times writing about it. This past weekend in Los Angeles, you had a big uh, uh, a dinner, uh, a gay and lesbian uh, organization that urged the Hollywood film community to uh, pull out of productions in Georgia. So the perception is out there. And the question is, how do we turn this around if, in fact, the bill isn't what uh, some of the critics think it is. I, I, I think we have to message <clears throat> in a very aggressive way uh, exactly what the bill is, which does require an understanding of the bill rather than the propaganda, whether the propaganda is coming from those who may not have liked it being passed or those who felt it didn't go far enough. Uh, I think that's the answer. Okay. I'll tell you what we're going to do. Let's take a break. We have a number of other measures we want to talk about, not the least of which, of course, is campus carry and where that's headed. That's a big one in this final uh, hours or so of the session. So uh, let's pause for just a minute, and we'll come right back with more lawmakers in just a moment. On Masterpiece Mystery. Sydney disappointing us all by becoming a vicar. The man of God. Such a shame. From the Grandchester Mysteries by James Runcie. People are saying you should get yourself a wife. When I heard you speak, I knew that I could trust you. Stephen did not kill himself. Murder? Yes, Inspector. It's murky waters you're sticking your toe into, Mr. Chambers. James Norton and Robson Green star in Grandchester on Masterpiece Mystery. Tonight at 9 on GPB. Welcome back to Lawmakers. I'm Bill Nygut. I'm here with Jim Galloway, the political reporter or writer for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, and the Speaker of the State House, David Ralston. Uh, again, Speaker Ralston, thanks for being here. Jim? Well, uh, I guess the, the other big uh, topic we need to address is campus carry. Uh, the House has passed a bill. The Senate uh, uh, rubber stamped it, sent it on to the governor, and the governor says, well, we need a few changes. So we've got a general gun bill that's still out there, is it not? And are those changes going to come? I don't know. I, uh, y you know, uh, that bill was thoroughly, exhaustively vetted, debated, and discussed in the House. It went through the committee process on the Senate. Um, you know, I sort of compare it to a, um, uh, a trial in a courtroom. 
you know, everybody gets a chance to put up their evidence, argue their case. The jury renders a decision. Uh, and then, the, but there is no next day to come in and say, well, can I argue again or can I have some more evidence? Um, I consider the uh, issue closed. Uh, I think it's a good bill, and uh, I'm, I'm hoping it will be signed into law. Did you get some mixed signals from the governor? I know you uh, <clears throat> value your relationship with the governor of the state of Georgia, but he seemed to indicate at a certain point during the uh, deliberations over the bill that he probably could sign the bill as it stood. And then after uh, it's gone through the process, he suddenly finds some tweaks that he believes are essential. Were you caught off guard when he uh, suggested there are some changes he wanted to see? Yeah, I, I, nothing, nothing really surprises me in this process. <laughs> well, that may uh, and, be. And, and, but... and, I, and, I, and I say that very respectfully. I have the greatest amount of respect for this governor. I've known this governor for uh, almost 40 years. Uh, he, he is a great leader and he's a good person. Uh, I respect his opinion. We have many discussions on issues that uh, have been and will always be private because we need that sort of give and take. Um, and um, uh, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm hopeful and optimistic that he will sign the bill into law. As is. As is. So Representative Jaspers was here the other night, and of course he's sort of the father of the uh, the gun bills, uh, the guns everywhere legislation, as it became known. And he said, asked a direct question, what changes are you willing to make? He said, none, we're not changing it at all. Is that your posture? My posture is, is that we went through the process in the House. We had a very thorough process, a very fair process. We debated it. We have voted it. I'm not going to ask the members of the House of Representatives to backtrack now. Um, and uh, that's that's where I am. I support Representative Jaspers. Would you be in favor of letting it uh, proceed for a, for a year and then maybe in next January taking another look at it at, at the governor's concerns? Well, I th I think we need to go ahead and and and, and sign this into law. Frankly, um, uh, you know we were responding to the concerns of many Georgians that we heard from uh, in this process. Um, that we're concerned that we continue to sort of nibble away and carve out uh, our basic constitutional rights under the Second Amendment. Uh, and so I don't really think delaying that makes anything better. The governor is in a tough spot. It's probably the toughest spot I can think of in post-session, since it will soon be over, uh, bill signing, this bill signing period, because he's got two hot-button uh, bills on his desk, campus carry, which he claims he needs, he believes there ought to be changes in, which we can assume are changes that come from the Board of Regents directed to him, I assume. Um, and then he's got the religious liberty bill. Can you imagine a that the governor, if he wants to continue his political capital to pass uh, uh, major uh, bills in the next couple of sessions before he leaves, can he afford to veto one or both of these bills and maintain his standing with all of your members? I, I don't want to speculate about that uh, again. I, I have, uh, first of all, a great friendship with this governor. I have great respect for him. Uh, he's been a great partner. I anticipate, I, I, I see nothing that would change that. Uh, and, 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 and I respect that he has a job as governor that's different than ours as legislators. Um, and um, uh, I know that he's going to do what he believes is the right thing to do. And um, until that happens, uh, you know, I don't want to get into uh, a what if uh, this happens or that happens kind of uh, discussion. Ms. Mr. Speaker, let me ask you, this is the second election cycle where we will have a primary very, very close on mm -hmm. the heels of a legislative session. I think uh, seven weeks, maybe even less now on May 24th. Uh, do you think it's impacting the legislation that comes before you in, in that you've got, you've got more lawmakers worried about preparing themselves for a challenger? And, and would you like to see that more air between 
a, a, a legislative session and a primary? I don't think it's impacting uh, what decisions they make. I mean, I, I couldn't imagine anyone that would vote on any of the measures that we're talking about here today differently if the primary were back in July or August or uh, I'm old enough now to remember when it was in September. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't think that that would make a difference. Uh, I'm, I'm, I've kind of gotten uh, used to the, the, the short period of time between. I think the only impact that it may have had has, is, is probably it makes us a little more uh, uh, cognizant of the fact that, you know, we need to get the session wrapped up. Uh, we're going to do our work. We're going to do it the right way. Uh, take the, as much time as we can, uh, but that there is that event that's going to happen out there. Well, there's I, don't also think it's, I don't think it's impacting people's decision to vote yay or nay. Could we talk about a couple other uh, issues sure. in the little time we have left? Uh, uh, processing rape kits, uh, mm -hmm. the measure that your house passed uh, it, and that you endorsed that got overwhelmingly uh, overwhelming support from the House and with some Republicans in the Senate have said we'd like to uh, 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 get a vote on this too has been held back by Senator Renee Unterman. Uh, are, are you how disappointed are you that that's not coming forward at this point? I, I'm disappointed and let me say that one of the things that uh, that doesn't get reported enough or discussed enough, I think, about this session has been the degree of cooperation between both caucuses in the House, for example. We've had a great working relationship with our friends on the other side of the aisle. I think Georgians like that, frankly, uh, that we can join forces on, on significant uh, uh, improvements to public policy. That was one example. That bill was carried by Representative Scott Holcomb, mm -hmm. uh, who is a member of the Democratic Caucus. Um, I have a lot of respect for Representative Holcomb. He did great work on that bill. I supported the bill. Um, and I think it's really unfortunate uh, and disappointing that uh, I think other people's personal agendas got in the way of us being able to c complete discussion on an important public policy initiative. Uh, I think that is disappointing. Okay. Um, let's talk about uh, another issue that ha was held back, and that was um, the uh, medical marijuana expanding mm. the list of conditions, once again held in a committee chaired by Senator Utterman. Uh, you've always praised Alan Peake for the way he's worked on this legislation. Uh, that, too, should we be expanding the conditions that uh, can be covered by cannabis oil? Well, I... Uh, let me let me begin by echoing what I've said many times, and that is uh, Alan Peak has done just uh, tremendous work on a uh, on a challenging issue. Uh, I was happy to help him last session on House Bill One. Uh, I supported him this year on his um, uh, on on taking what I believe was the next step. Uh, I think the larger discussion is is uh, on that issue is not so much the list of conditions but on how we uh, obtain production is production. And I think that's the discussion that we're going to continue to have to focus on is finding a way forward on that that will be acceptable to uh, as many people as is possible. Uh, and then we can talk about expanding the conditions. But until we talk about uh, production and cultivation, uh, then that's, I think, uh, on, on down the road. We are completely out of time. Um, you obviously have a lot more on your plate as we come to the end of the session. And as we always do, wait to hear you say, signy die. From, how does that go? <laughs> uh, <laughs> how do you say is it? is adjourned, signy die. There you go. <laughs> Thank you and so I much. I can't wait to say that. I'll bet you can. <laughs> Jim Galloway, Speaker Russell, thanks so much for being here. Thank you. And that does Jim. it for us for day 39 of the 2016 session. One more day to go and everybody up at this table is glad to hear that. Track us on Facebook and Twitter at GPB News or you can check our website gpb.org slash lawmakers and remember you can hear a political rewind on GPB radio live
live every Wednesday, tomorrow at 2, Fridays at 3, the best group of political insiders, including Jim Galloway in town. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We'll see you again Thursday for our one-hour special edition of Lawmakers. I'm Bill Nygut. Good night.